Celeste Kidd, who is a professor at Berkeley, and she works on uh, language acquisition, knowledge acquisition in young children using um, an, uh, a combination of computational and behavioral methods. And uh, she says she draws um, inspiration both from classical psychology, so she's in the Department of Psychology, and also with new computational methods uh, with very current techniques. And she's a wonderful speaker, and I've once I've met her on a panel before in Berkeley. She's been at Rutgers, she got a PhD for at Rutgers, I think a postdoc at MIT. And um, I think there's a lot to learn from human learning when we try to apply it to even non-humans, because some people think of babies as not quite human yet. Uh, so Celeste, please take it away. And thank you very much for willing to give us this talk. Thank, thank you so much, Shafi. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much to all organizers for uh, inviting, me, inviting me here to talk. Um, uh, so today I'm going to be talking about how humans gain the foundational knowledge that allows them to communicate. Um, uh, I, I called my talk the foundations of early human learning, but obviously I was like, it's also the foundations of later human learning. So uh, even though a lot of the work uh, is with babies, it's not really about babies. It's how people learn to communicate uh, and more broadly than that, how they form beliefs uh, and learn things in general. Uh, language, uh, language acquisition is a huge topic, so I'm necessarily going to have to pick and choose just a subset uh, of different aspects to focus on. Specifically, I'm going to be focusing on a few core general principles that human infants employ in the process of learning to communicate with others. Language learning, uh, I thought Jonathan's talk did a great job of setting up, um, uh, involves building a lot of higher order representations from lower level ones. Uh, startings with things like, uh, uh, you know, the, pl the place of articulation, aspects of the sounds, uh, uh, then moving up to syllables, uh, then from syllables moving up to words and from words to uh, what the words refer to in the world, the reference uh, to concepts and categories and, and so on and so on. Um, language is one of the few human conceptual domains in which we have a handle on the psychological components of uh, the conceptual representations in a way that allows us to know something about the, the, the way that they're related to each other, the, the kind of hierarchy. Uh, what, so that, that, that feature of it makes it a potentially useful domain uh, for studying the nature of concepts and learning in general. Uh, what I want to do in this talk is walk through some key principles that human use, uh, starting in infancy but continuing through adulthood to not just learn language but to, but to learn everything else. Um, I'm going to limit myself to just four ways in which we as humans learn to communicate uh, and learn, learn about things in the world. So the first thing uh, that, that baby humans need to do in order to get a handle on communication uh, is to track statistics. Uh, specifically, they're tracking statistics from their environment. Um, babies enter the world able to attract co-occurrences and use them uh, to make sense of the world. Actually, not just, not just uh, uh, at birth are they able to do that, as like they track statistics about things like the rhythmic properties of their language uh, in, in, in utero and uh, are, are born with some uh, rudimentary knowledge of some aspects of their linguistic environment. Uh, one of the major pieces of evidence that we have for uh, infants' ability to uh, do statistical learning is, is work by Jenny Safran with Dick Aslan and Lisa Newport. Uh, this work examined how infants hear a continuous speech stream and somehow figure out where the individual words are. Uh, unlike words on the written page, uh, spoken words don't have any breaks between them. Uh, if you ever heard a language that you don't speak, uh, you know it's, it's, it's difficult to be able to pull out just one word from it. Uh, so that's the position that infants are in when they're, when they're learning their target language. Uh, if you consider a phrase that a baby might hear, something like pretty baby, uh, from the infant's point of view, uh, that could all be one word, uh, or it could be four, pretty, bay, and be, uh, or two or three. Uh, with just that string by itself, there's no way to know except for uh, the, the, the two word edges. Um, uh, you know, you know that those are boundaries, um, but uh, where the other boundaries are, how many words this is, is, is unclear. Uh, so uh, the idea that Jenny Safran and her colleagues had was that maybe infants could track statistics across syllables, across utterances, uh, as they're listening to speech incoming, uh, and use those statistics in order to work out where the words were. 
So if you look at these phrases, you start to notice that certain chunks track together. Uh, so a baby could hear a phrase like pretty mama and pretty kitty and notice that pretty uh, tends to move together as a unit. So maybe pretty is one word. Uh, they could hear happy baby and silly baby uh, and notice again that, that baby is moving together as a unit. And in that way, by tracking those uh, transitional statistics, uh, figure out where the word boundaries are. Uh, there's a catch. <laughs> so for them to be able to do that, uh, you'd have to demonstrate that infants are capable of tracking the transitional statistics uh, between a relatively large number of different types of units uh, over many different, many different syllables. Uh, so they designed an experiment to test to see if infants could, could do that. Uh, and in this experiment, they played two minutes of this speech stream for infants composed of nonsense syllables like this. Uh, let me play a little segment so you can kind of hear it. And you, 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 you get the, get the gist. So that's just a little clip. Um, and, uh, whoops. Uh, this, this nonsense language uh, that they played to infants was constructed uh, in a way that it was composed of novel word-like units that moved together. Uh, so the transitional, transitional statistics between the syllables uh, are, are different. Uh, if you were tracking the transitional statistics, you could theoretically identify two different types of items that could be pulled from this stream. Novel words composed of syllables that are tracking together uh, and what they called part words uh, which occurred in the speech stream, but contained uh, and contained syllables that all occurred equally often in the speech stream, uh, but that did not occur as often as a unit together. Uh, after just two minutes of exposure to this nonsense language, infants showed that they were able to differentiate between uh, these two different types of uh, items from, from the speech stream, uh, the ones that traveled together as units and the, and the ones that did not. Uh, specifically, uh, they showed a greater interest in the part words, uh, a pattern commonly interpreted as indicating uh, that infants found those part words surprising. This was some of the first big evidence that infants can track statistics and use them uh, to form new concepts. And uh, it, it started a, a, a wave of other um, experiments showing that it wasn't just in the domain of speech, uh, that just tracking environmental statistics as they come in um, could be useful. So uh, uh, this was not just limited to uh, the auditory domain. This is, this is uh, some visual stimuli from an experiment by Joseph Heiser and Dick Aslan uh, showing that uh, infants can also track uh, visual co-occurrence statistics. Uh, this is uh, some, some, some visual scenes that are composed of a kind of grammar. Uh, there are these little um, units that are like words um, that uh, infants are presented with, and just as they did with the auditory stimuli, they're able to notice uh, when two, uh, two shapes uh, are in the same configuration across multiple different displays. Uh, so they're able to infer the lexicon uh, from, a, from a surprisingly small amount of exposure. Uh, statistical learning is a powerful uh, domain general mechanism that could potentially explain a lot of great learning feats, including learning language. Uh, it's simple, it's powerful, uh, and uh, the concepts is, it allows you to learn can, can build over time, uh, in, like in the, in, the, in the sense of building up a hierarchy um, to, to acquiring uh, a full-blown full full language. Um, uh, and we know that that ability is shared by many other species, in including non-human primates, uh, rats, songbirds, and many others. Uh, there's a great uh, 2018 review by uh, Chiara Sal S Santolin and Jenny Safran uh, uh, that uh, I'd recommend checking out. It came out in, in, in Trends in Cognitive Sciences in, in 2018. Uh, we know that human infants use this general learning mechanism to build up their knowledge over time, uh, building bigger representations out of the last set of building blocks that they acquired. Uh, so initially, uh, human infants track statistics over syllables in order to learn that there's a spoken word apple. Uh, then they track the co-occurrence statistics between that word and objects in the world uh, in order to learn what apple is actually referring to, uh, to eventually uh, using statistics in order to form uh, uh, a, a category of apples that includes red apples and green apples, uh, but excludes uh, oranges and, and peaches. And so on and so on, uh, increasingly, uh, building higher levels of representation. So 
so the goal of the infant um, is to uh, eventually acquire an adult-like understanding about how things work in the world, uh, including different concepts uh, and how those concepts can be combined. Uh, this mechanism I mentioned is not just powerful uh, for learning about language, uh, it's also what uh, humans are using in order to learn about what causes what in the world. Uh, it allows you to learn how, how things work. So this is how you build up your adult model of the, the, the mental model of the world. Uh, the better and the more accurate your predictions uh, with, with your mental model, uh, the better decisions that you can, you can make um, uh, and the more, the more you can optimize utility. Um, but this is where it gets really interesting. Uh, this mental model of the world that's generating the expectations, uh, it's also helping you generate expectations about where in the world uh, you should search for the next set of information. Uh, so the early things that you learn uh, are feeding into your subsequent decisions. Uh, it's directly shaping uh, where you attend to, where you look, and ultimately what you know of the world. Uh, the difficulty in, in finding truth for us as humans is that there's far more knowledge in the world than any one person could possibly ever obtain, uh, which means that an individual is forced to, to pick and choose. Each moment when a person has selected one thing to learn from, uh, they're necessarily missing out on everything else. So each choice matters because it's coming with a huge opportunity cost. Uh, as a very simple example, uh, you only have one set of eyes. So uh, if you are sitting and you are looking in one direction, uh, you're necessarily missing out on anything that's happening, uh, all the directions that you're not fixating, as like behind you, uh, for example. Uh, that simple fact has, has really profound implications. Uh, it means that to be a person in the world, you, you have to pick and choose. Uh, you're going to be having to form beliefs based on just a small subset of all of the information that's theoretically available to you in the world. Uh, and you're not conscious of it, but you're making at least half a million decisions, uh, very quick decisions uh, every day about where to look, uh, what to explore, what to click, what to read, what to listen to, um, uh, who to talk to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how you make those decisions is informed by what you already know, uh, what you believe to be true, and where you expect to have uncertainty. Uh, you have to make those decisions very quickly, uh, so there's, there's no time to lament them, uh, and uh, you're limited to sampling and forming beliefs, of course, uh, based on what's available to you as an individual. Uh, so the second thing uh, human infants do to learn uh, is that they seek out uh, what isn't understood. Uh, our systems have a very effective built-in mechanism uh, for helping us avoid wasting time uh, and navigating the challenges of information overload in the world. Uh, and that mechanism's common name uh, is, is boredom. Uh, for example, our systems engage boredom when we're confident that we know everything that there is to know. Uh, this is very rational. It's like, why should you keep uh, watching if you, already, if you already know everything? There's no learning value. Um, these systems uh, are good in that they prevent us from hyperfixating, uh, but they do so at the cost of sometimes shutting down the information tap uh, before we've gotten the right idea. Uh, so they are, they are not perfect systems. Uh, I'm not gonna be focusing on that in today's talk, but um, last week I gave a tech talk at X that does focus on that. So if you're interested, uh, you can, you can uh, search for that or, or message me. Uh, in my lab, we've used eye trackers to study the principles that guide our sampling and learning. Uh, I'm going to tell you about a set of studies we did with human infants uh, in this section. Uh, these, these studies taught us a lot about human infants solve that, that sampling problem that I, I made reference to, uh, how uh, we as humans weigh information gain against opportunity cost. Uh, so in this series of experiments, uh, we showed infants displays that were designed to elicit expectations uh, while allowing us to construct a reasonable probabilistic model of these expectations moment to moment as the displays unfolded over time. Uh, the, in these displays, objects popped out of boxes in some order. Um, I'll show you what that looks like. These uh, experiments with infants always start with an attention getter and we use a baby who is laughing because babies really like looking at other babies. Uh, is, can you guys hear it okay? Okay, so there's objects popping out of boxes. There's exactly one object in each box. Um, uh, across the trials, there's different boxes with different objects. Uh, yes. Hopefully you get the intuition that some are 
more surprising. There's the attention getter again. And I'll show you just a couple, a couple moves of that one. That one keeps keeps going. Um, uh, this is cuter. This is a baby sitting and doing the experiment. Uh, so as long as she kept looking, the design is contingent. Uh, as long as she keeps looking, uh, the displays keep unfolding. Uh, objects keep popping out of boxes. Um, the mom is wearing headphones so that the, the parent can't influence uh, what, the, what the kid is interested in. She almost looks away but doesn't. And she looks away for a criterion time of one second. Laughing baby comes back, she resets, and we can just do that over and over again. Uh, uh, so we can get a large amount of, of data um, from, from each baby. Okay, um, uh, to quantify these expectations, we applied a textbook example from Bayesian statistics, uh, a Dirichlet multinomial, uh, which provides an estimate of probability uh, that each box will activate next given the previous sequence of events. Uh, at each point in time, uh, the baby either looks away or they don't. <laughs> um, and uh, if they don't, then we move on to the next, the next trial. Uh, the next, the, sorry, the next box pops open. Um, we can take the posterior of each action at each moment in time and then use it to compute a surprisal value for each event in the sequence. Uh, with this in hand, we, we can then plot the probability of infants actual look away behavior uh, as a function of the surprisal value of the event. This allows us to uncover the relationship between idealized probabilistic expectations and children's behavior in a simple and independent way. And when we do that, uh, we get what we've uh, described as a, as a Goldilocks effect, by which uh, I mean that infants tend to look away at events that are highly predictable, uh, but also uh, they tend to look away at events that are highly surprising, um, like this. Uh, it also applies controlling for other factors like the posterior entropy, uh, and even holds when we model transitional probabilities, uh, which are important in language learning uh, rather than doing each, each event independently. Uh, it's true not just of visual attention, attention to visual sequences, uh, but also auditory ones as well. Uh, that's really important to know since uh, auditory statistics are likely to be most important for the first stages of language learning. Uh, oh, and I should also mention, I was like, we have new data. I was like, there's, there's a paper under review. Uh, it's also true for older children, uh, children over three years old. Uh, we just did some new work that was led by uh, now UPenn postdoctoral scholar, uh, Laura Soski, uh, who's, who's, who's working at the, the Center for Autism Research. Uh, here's an example of an infant doing an auditory version of the task, uh, one in which the model is estimating the surprisal based on the occurrence of items in the sound sequence, uh, not things in the visual sequence. Uh, so we're still using the eye tracker uh, and uh, using that to uh, allow the infant to control what they see. Uh, we're using a visual display in order to keep their attention, uh, but we're holding it constant uh, and changing the items in the auditory sequence. Same guy over and over again, and the sounds are what's varying. She looks away. She gets another trial. Yeah, look away. Um, uh, we get that same Goldilocks effect of disengagement uh, at points of high and low surprisal here as well. Uh, so uh, this, this, this guiding principle um, doesn't just apply at, at the group average level, it also applies at the level of individual inference. Uh, this kind of U-shaped function we think represents a broadly applicable strategy for organizing your search for information in the world. Learning scientists had previously suggested that this kind of a pattern might be helpful for uh, allowing users to seek out things that are valuable for learning. Uh, for example, 
Uh, if you imagine picking a book to read, uh, you can imagine that this ABC book is not very attractive as an option uh, because uh, as an adult who knows my ABCs, uh, I already know this. There's not a lot of new information that I can gain there. Uh, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, if you're to go for the most new information possible, uh, say you pick a book on a topic you don't know anything about, I don't know anything about billiards, um, uh, in a language that you do not yet speak, uh, you could potentially learn two things at once, uh, but you really can't uh, because uh, you can't get any traction. I was like, you're missing the base levels of representation that you need in order to make sense of it. Um, instead, uh, the most attractive option falls in the, the Goldilocks zone. Uh, so something like a book uh, in a language I, I speak on a topic on which I have some background. Uh, this is a, a new one uh, that I'm, I'm reading right now, which is very good. Uh, these kinds of decisions we think originate with the same type of cognitive system, uh, which favors material that is a little bit surprising, uh, but not overly surprising given what you currently understand. Um, importantly, in order to exhibit such regularities, uh, linking attention and an idealized model of the stimuli, infants have to be uh, tracking those statistics and building expectations about the world uh, and using those in order to, to, to guide uh, uh, their decisions about whether to continue watching or to disengage. Uh, this idea is consistent with a lot of other evidence that we have from developmental psych uh, that suggests that uh, very young uh, humans seek out experiences that violate their expectations, but just a little. Uh, so for example, in displays like this, uh, if a ball is animated to bounce around in a box with a hole in one side, uh, just one hole in one side uh, and three holes in the other, uh, infants attend longer when the ball exits out of the less likely side, uh, which you might expect uh, is an indicator that means that they find that surprising. Uh, and they attend for less long when the ball does the, the more likely thing. Uh, so if the ball flies out of the side that has more holes in it, uh, possibly the more expected side, uh, then they're, they're not as interested. Uh, if it doesn't violate your expectations, it carries little information, so you're, you're less interested. Um, there's cool work from uh, people like Laura Schultz and Liz Bonowitz with older kids suggesting that uh, young humans uh, don't don't just follow this a pattern in terms of deciding where to attend to, uh, they also follow it when they're deciding what to play with. Uh, so uh, they have this study uh, where there's these toys that look like this um, and kids will play longer with the toy uh, when they haven't yet observed evidence uh, that makes clear what the causal structure of the toy is. Uh, so this, these, these boxes um, uh, uh, have two levers and two puppets that pop out of the top. Uh, the, the manipulation is, is the uh, demonstration that they get before they're offered the opportunity to play with it. Uh, either both levers are pulled at once, so it is unclear uh, which lever leads to which puppet popping out, uh, or they're demonstrated one at a time. Uh, and if you demonstrate the confounded evidence, uh, that toy is a lot more attractive, uh, indicating that uh, kids are um, seeking opportunities to learn about the causal structure of the world. Okay, three, three out of four things. This is the third thing. Um, once you're tracking the statistics uh, and using them to guide your search, uh, you can also leverage statistically reliable cues uh, to gather additional information about communication uh, and everything else worth learning. Uh, I'm gonna pick just two examples from our lab. Uh, for example, uh, we've looked at toddlers' ability to leverage a somewhat unexpected cue in order to learn language more effectively. Uh, that unexpected cue is speech disfluencies, including uh and um. Uh, while you probably don't intentionally produce these, uh, they are a feature of natural speech. Uh, and if you think that you don't produce them, uh, I, I promise you for not, not memorized things you do. Uh, and uh, if you'd like, I can point them out, but you'll be self-conscious for days. So um, I, I warned you. Um, so uh, the thing about speech fluencies is that they occur in predictable places, um, specifically uh, before words that are infrequent uh, and also before object labels that are new to the conversation. So pretend that these two objects are present on a counter and I said I was going to make some orange juice. Uh, now imagine if I asked if you could please hand me the, uh, 
you probably feel your eyes drifting over to the juicer um, and not to the orange. Uh, and if this were a real life situation, uh, it's, it's very likely you'd start to reach over to the juicer um, without me even having gotten to the word juicer. Um, so uh, uh, you can anticipate I'm going to say juicer because uh, oranges are previously mentioned if I was talking about orange juice and oranges are also a more frequent word uh, than juicer. Um, so uh, because they were just mentioned and they're more frequent, they're less likely to uh, uh, induce processing difficulties that result in the speech disfluency. Um, Uh, small humans are, are also capable of uh, drawing that inference about a speaker's referential intentions. Uh, in an experiment that we ran a while back, we presented toddlers who spoke just, just a few words themselves, so these are not super verbal kids, uh, with similar situations, uh, each one featuring a frequent um, mentioned object uh, and then one unmentioned novel one. We used eye trackers uh, like before to measure where on the screen that they looked. Uh, and specifically, we were interested in the period right before the object was named. Uh, that spot was either occupied by a, a, a bit of fluent speech or by lengthening like the and a filled pause disfluency like uh, uh, we wanted to know if the disfluency prompted the infants to look towards the weirder unmentioned object. And what we found that this is a skill that develops over time uh, and starts to emerge around two years of age uh, and continues um, to develop uh, through the, the early portion of a kid's life. This is something that um, uh, adults uh, are able to do, as like adults are able to, to, to use this cue in order to anticipate what somebody is going to talk, talk, talk about next. Uh, and even young kids, although they're not saying very many words themselves, they've picked up on this statistical regularity. Um, for two-year-olds, this is a very useful trick uh, because kids are still in the process of learning uh, what words in the world mean. It's like they're in a period of heavy uh, vocabulary development. Uh, so allowing a kid to anticipate that something that is infrequently labeled is about to be mentioned so that they can be ready and looking at it uh, by the time the object label is actually mentioned uh, is, is hugely helpful. Uh, this is just one in a, a whole line of evidence demonstrating how young kids are able to leverage partial knowledge in order to gain more. I want to show you just one more example from a study led by Emily Sumner and Erica DeAngelis uh, in a, 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 that we did a, a few years ago. Uh, this study, uh, how we did it is we asked kids to choose among two options in several different games that we made up. I'm going to show you a video and what I want you to do is see if you can spot the regularities in how this two-year-old is responding. Does the playground have pine or oak trees? Oak trees. Oak trees. Look, it's a tree. An oak tree. Where are you going to put it? Oh, yeah. Next to the TV? Yeah. It's a school fence brick or wood? Wood. Wood. Here you go. Where's it gonna go? Oh, very nice. Huh? Is Rory's shirt yellow or red? What? Red. <laughs> right. Um. So she's uh she's choosing the choosing the second thing. Um. Uh. And this was a very common pattern uh, for kids uh, at this age to exhibit. Um, uh, overwhelmingly, kids in the early stages of language production, when they're first starting to say um, uh, say words and respond to questions like these, uh, they are very likely to choose the second of two choices that are offered. Uh, upwards of seventy five percent of the time in the task I just I just presented. Um, this effect uh, you can see was was large, uh, and it didn't just occur in our weird lab tasks. Uh, it also occurred uh, in naturalistic responses to parental questions that we pulled from a giant corpus of kids' speech recordings called, called Childless. Uh, this bias is very strong at two, uh, and it decreases in a naturalistic environment as children learn more words and as they mature. Uh, but uh, you can bring it back in older children uh, if you present them with choices that are longer and involve more syllables. Uh, so if you're trying to 
uh, coerce your child into making a particular choice while still wanting them to feel like they are making a choice themselves, uh, this is a great strategy to use. Um, uh, as you increase the number of syllables, presumably it increases the demands on their working memory. Uh, and uh, it, we, we don't know exactly why it might be the case, but a, a, a good possible explanation is um, uh, the second thing is just, is just more accessible. Um, this uh, is a, a good demonstration of uh, uh, what you see in young kids is sometimes not what you think it is. Uh, in language development research, speech productions, word productions um, are often taken as a gold standard uh, as evidence that the kid knows something um, about uh, the concept to which that word refers. So like this is a great demonstration of uh, kids saying things uh, that they probably don't know, they may not know um, what, the, what the referent actually is. Okay, fourth and final thing uh, you need to do to learn to communicate. Uh, you continuously update everything that you have learned. Uh, human beliefs are inferences, not records. Uh, they're probabilistic expectations. Uh, a lot of the time, the way that we talk about kids' languages as though once they've learned something, uh, they filed it away and they're done. Uh, it's baked into how we talk about these things. So you say things like, uh, uh, my, my toddler uh, learned the word spoon. Uh, and you might think that if a child is always using a word in the correct context uh, uh, and always recognizing it when it's spoken to them, uh, that that concept is, is at least mostly, uh, mostly, mostly built. But um, uh, that's, that's not at all how it works. And uh, we don't have a whole lot of empirical work with kids probing exactly what their concepts look like, but it is very likely uh, that they are a far, a far way away from, from um, uh, adults' concepts. Um, uh, okay, um, so uh, with every new piece of data that a kid experiences, they're updating their concept a little bit. Uh, uh, and we also have evidence that that's not just true of kids who are in the early stages of building their vocabulary. Uh, that's, that's true of adults too. Um, so with something like a spoon, uh, with every spoon that you encounter, uh, you update your concept just a teeny bit. Uh, and if you move to a place uh, that has spoons that are more atypical or in the future, if culinary design trends shift uh, towards shorter, fatter spoons or something like that, uh, your concept shifts right along with those changes uh, and you don't even notice that that's happening. Uh, your beliefs about spoons change uh, right along with the shifts in the data that you're observing. Since every child and every person uh, takes a different path through life uh, and encounters their own unique set of um, a sequence of spoons in this case, uh, it makes sense, it follows that uh, every person is going to have their own unique set of concepts. Uh, and more generally, uh, their own unique set of beliefs about what's true in the world that maybe often roughly match, but which are uh, unlikely to uh, be identical. So we're interested, uh, we were interested in measuring uh, the degree to which people in the population share common concepts. Uh, we were interested in how much diversity there is. Uh, and uh, given that we expected to see some diversity, uh, are people aware of it when they're communicating? To do this, we ask people to rate similarities between common concepts following classic methods in cognitive psychology from people like Roger Shepard and others. Some of these concepts were political and some were just common nouns. Uh, we were interested in discovering how many latent versions of each concept lived in the population. This is a T-SNE plot colored according to the clustering results from a Chinese restaurant process where response vectors for each concept were clustered across individuals in the population. For instance, uh, based on the responses people gave to similarity judgments to Richard Nixon, uh, we arrived at a distribution over different Nixon concepts that people uh, might have in the population. Um, in uh, this experiment, people were actually asked twice. Uh, so this is their relative reliability in, in answering. Sorry, uh, what, did they, what did you ask here? I, I, I missed it. Oh, that's okay. I'll, I'll go back to the, so, so they're asked a series of questions. Oh, what is most similar? Okay, okay, got it. Yeah, yeah so, so it's, a, it's a binary choice and as like you get asked to compare everyone to every other one. Uh, the reason why we use this approach instead of just saying like, I don't know, some, something more 
uh, free form, um, uh, we want to um, be controlling for the context. So we're asking you to rate it in this particular context and everybody has the same context. Um, uh, if you thought that we all had basically the same concepts for these words, uh, what you'd expect to see is one single cluster. Uh, but what we find instead is that there are about five to 10 different distinct concept clusters for each of these labels in the population. Uh, that said, there's not no difference between all of these things. Uh, we use the species, oh, sorry, I forgot a detail. Um, we use a species count estimator from ecology to extend the number of clusters in our sample uh, to that of the entire population on the planet uh, using methods like good Turing estimators. We find that the number is approximately what we should expect to see for the entire population in, in our sample. Uh, when we started this work, uh, we expected to see uh, less variation for concrete things that you could observe uh, and more variation for the abstract ones. Uh, and that turns out to mostly be true, uh, but uh, what we were surprised to see is how much variation there is even among uh, the concrete the concrete concepts, uh, although people do uh, vary more on some concepts than others. Um, so here is salmon, you're just pulling out, uh, that has about three main types of concepts. Uh, there's more agreement here uh, and fewer, 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 um, uh, fewer types of concepts for salmon, uh, but there's less agreement on uh, this one, Joe Biden, uh, the increased number of clusters here indicates that Joe Biden means, means fundamentally different things to different people. For this and our experiments in this, uh, other experiments in this area, we get our similarity data in a way that's controlling for the context, uh, as I just mentioned. Uh, so even in this, this same context, uh, people's uh, concepts vary quite a bit. We weren't just interested though in the absolute number of concepts. Uh, we were interested in given that there's this diversity, uh, do people know when they use a word that the person who is hearing it may not be activating the same concept that they are? Um, so to look at this, uh, we collected a measure of conceptual alignment across people. And the way we did th that we did that um, was we asked people questions like this. Uh, how many people out of 100 would agree with you that X is an example of concept Y? Uh, we asked people to report how many people they expected would share their concept. Uh, and what we found uh, was this. Uh, this plot represents people's expectations for others to possess the same concepts as them. Uh, if people were perfectly in tune with the variance in others' concepts, you'd expect to see all of the data clustered along that diagonal line. Uh, but instead, uh, what you see is that people tend to uh, overestimate how much other people will agree with their particular version of a concept. Uh, in other words, uh, they expect that when they use a particular word, uh, other people will share their concept more often than is, is actually true. So um, two people using the same word in the same context, uh, they do not necessarily mean the same thing. Uh, what's worse, uh, they generally are not aware of this fact. Uh, it's easy to see how this could uh, be a, a potential hindrance to uh, effective communication. Uh, that was the last one. Um, so there you have it. That's four ways in which we learn. Uh, these represent mechanisms we employ uh, to learn how to communicate as humans. Uh, but like I mentioned, they're, they're a lot more general than that. Uh, they're also employed uh, to form all kinds of mental representations. And in turn, uh, they, they form the foundations of what we believe to be true. Uh, number one, Humans continuously track statistics. Two, uh, they seek out what isn't understood. Uh, three, they leverage statistically reliable cues. Uh, and four, they, they, they continuously update, uh, even for things that you might think not think of as being continuously updated as like things like spoons. Um, that's all um, I want to say, uh, but I want to thank my lab, <laughs> especially uh, all of the people uh, in pink there who directly worked on the projects that I spoke about today. Uh, thank you again so much for the or to the organizers and thank all of you um, for uh, coming and listening to me. I'm happy to answer some questions if we have some time. Also, if we don't have some time, there's my email and my Twitter and my everything. So um, I'll be right here till the pandemic ends. In Berkeley? In Berkeley. Thank you very much. I think there is a question or at least one in the chat. Uh, Oh, okay. From Marie Manili. 
Um, we were production kids. I agree with you. Productivity certainly does not entail comprehension, knowledge. This reminds me of a seminal, at least speech language pathology, speech and language. Uh, oh, this paper. I, like, I don't know that paper. I will check that out. Um, yeah, useful, useful to know. Yeah. It, it's one of those things that people don't, like everybody kind of knows, but we, as developmental psychologists, uh, like how do you know what word a kid knows? Uh, there's lots of cases of interesting anecdotes. If you actually go in and like probe <laughs> like what the kid knows when they're using a particular word, uh, I can't remember whose example this is, but uh, their kid used the word late in all of the right contexts. Uh, they recognized it, they, they reacted correctly when the parent used the word late. Uh, but when you explicitly asked the kid, uh, what does late mean? They said, uh, late is when you go to school and everyone already has their boots off. Um, so th that's like part of the definition, but that's like a very limited piece um, of what late means. And you'd never know that. Uh, most kids are not able to uh, so eloquently articulate <laughs> it's like their, their definitions for words. So uh, a lot of this just goes undiscovered because we don't have great ways uh, of getting at that. And I think there was an earlier question by Marie as well on 1249. Uh, oh, right. Um, Regarding statistical learning, am I right to assume that the existing body of literature um, uh, only accounted for statistical learning exhibited in typically developing infants? Um, uh, no, that's not the case. So um, I mentioned uh, uh, th there's more than one person who has looked at statistical learning in um, uh, children with autism. Laura Soski um, has been interested in uh, that topic and didn't have a chance to collect a full set um, of uh, that population uh, before uh, she, she finished her PhD. Um, but uh, uh, we piloted that study. I was like, we, you don't need very much data before you can get a sense of what the linking function looks like. Uh, based on the pilot data, uh, uh, kids with autism didn't look any different um, from uh, typically developing with the caveat that like we, before we publish it, we want to, we want a larger sample. Um, uh, older kids also, yes, appear to um, uh, have that U-shaped function that I talked about. Um, other people who um, have worked on statistical learning in um, special populations, uh, Jenny Safran actually has some work that was in progress and I don't, I don't know if it's published yet, but she was looking specifically at um, statistical learning uh, in uh, kids with, kids with autism. Um, am I missing, I read this, sorry, so many windows. Oh yeah. Um, are you aware of similar studies? Uh, this is from Paul Best. Are you aware of similar studies experimenting the tendency to choose the second option in adults? Uh, we have looked at response biases in adults uh, and it's more common uh, for adults to actually exhibit the other bias. Um, so uh, if uh, you are tired, adults usually have a primacy bias in those same kinds of questions. Um, uh, if you are tired, um, uh, then that, that, is likely, that is likely amplified. If you don't care, um, then that's amplified. Uh, uh, why it flips may have to do with adults being better able to anticipate that like a choice is coming up so I don't care, I just want to get it over with, um, uh, where, where kids probably are not able to anticipate it until the end of the sentence. They're just kind of lagged. Um, so uh, the choices have been named before they realize that there's a choice that they need to make. Um, any more questions? Then I would like to we're gonna have a few minutes of the closing, but I wanna first express my thanks to everybody and all the talks in the workshop. It's been really incredibly stimulating, um, fantastic. And, and also- Thank you guys for organizing. Thanks for the last session to Jonathan and to Les. So I think David wants to start a few, to say some summary words and Michael. Yeah, sure. My, Michael, do you wanna start? Yeah, so um, thanks everyone for uh, for joining. I think uh, it was a very interesting uh, workshop. At least I can speak for myself. I learned a lot. I think it was extremely diverse talks from uh, biologists, from computer scientists, covering uh, really uh, an improbable mixture of topics that I think otherwise you wouldn't find. And basically, people that I think would uh, 
almost never uh, meet together at uh, any other conference. So I think uh, really uh, thanks to the Simons Institute uh, for hosting uh, such uh, uh, an interesting event. And uh, uh, I, I think we heard a lot of uh, different things, but also a lot of common uh, things. Uh, well, to me, I think uh, the, the use of machine learning uh, Methods. Well, I'm obviously biased, but uh, seems like a very promising topic that, that was mentioned continuously in the research of different uh, species, and not only mentioned but also used. Uh, uh, what, what we've seen today, for example, about bat research, uh, we've seen. I should be pronouncing it properly. <laughs> that it doesn't sound like bad research, and uh, um, also, uh, uh, well, uh, obviously, what we are doing with the whales. Uh, I think the the, the the elephant sounds uh, are uh, look also very uh, promising for uh, for using machine learning research. Then uh, some analogies that could be drawn from human language uh, processing and uh, uh, developmental uh, studies in, in children uh, uh, could be applied to, to uh, non-human uh, non-human uh, species as well. So uh, David actually had uh, uh, maybe a few ideas about uh, the follow-up, and uh, maybe he wants to. to uh, to kick off maybe a short discussion about uh, what should be the next steps. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Shafi, and thank all the panelists and all the participants who stayed with us for, for all these hours on, 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 on screen. Um, I guess, yeah, this was, this was really, really interesting, and my head is exploding, and, um, and I love the interdisciplinary flair. I guess I've been, in the last few weeks, you know, thinking about the pandemic too, I've been reading some Norbert Wiener and cybernetics and, and um, really realizing how novel it is to, um, to really do core, core disciplinary, interdisciplinary work is, is pretty un, un, not, not incredibly common in, in academia at least. So um, thinking about next steps, yeah, we would just love, um, this is our, our first foray um, doing this kind, of, this kind of event and we would love some feedback from, from everyone on, on what they liked and what they didn't like and what could be some next steps and are there other speakers or other research areas that we missed um, and um, yeah and um, you know and of course um, you know our, our project uh, projectsteady.org we, we want everyone to sign up and um, so you can get updates and we could we could keep in touch with you and try to lure you into this um, this this tangled web we're creating but um, yeah, just to open up the forum to, to everyone here on, on um, you know, on, on their thoughts and feedback of the, of the two days. And how I can get this plant in better shape is some, some other question. Start talking to him, her. I'm not doing well here, so. So I, I guess my thought is uh, probably a thought of everyone, and, and, and that's uh, I would love to see some translation between the work on vision and the work on on uh, natural language, or on you know interpreting signals. Obviously, all of this stuff is signals, but the question is, how do you interpret? It seems like a, um, for example, the first candidate would be like the internal learning that Michal was talking in the context of NLP. And um, in general, there, you know, speaking as someone who's a cryptographer, which is completely the opposite, right? It's rather than trying to understand, you're trying to hide. But there are works in, um, you know, differential cryptoanalysis and, and breaking, which are quite sophisticated, but they actually reminded me of some things that Michal was talking about in terms of, um, you know, what would be the, the analogy to a patch and getting examples from, from ciphertext. And in general, and other things that sort of emerged here, this this issue of indistinguishability, you know, trying to uh, characterize something that's natural as distinguishable from random, um, you're trying to generate things by this again, but in other settings. Um, I'm actually wondering whether this approach of the unsupervised approach from for language to language translation, whether it could be applied, for example, for translating fMRI data to images, thinking of these as two different languages and applying a similar type of uh, mechanism. Right now I'm using other ways of my own encoders and decoders, but I didn't think of this shared embedding space and so on as uh, there could be very well tools I could borrow from NLP. So this is interesting. 
it is possible that that uh, why the, the reason why it works uh, for human languages is that language uh, basically this embedding captures not only the structure of the language per se but uh, the structure of the way that we express uh, we see our world and it, it probably it uh, it is very similar no matter if you speak in, in French or in Chinese so it's, it's probably something deeper than just the language itself but uh, well, but, but there are all the theories about but that's why I was asking about how similar those languages are, because fMRI brain activity and images are completely different, and they're organized in different locations. It doesn't re like in, in language, you still have the same temporal order. You said one sentence, and then another sentence, and then a third. Maybe the words in the sentence are somewhat different in one language and another, but you won't mix the sentences. Whereas in brain regions things would be organized totally differently inside the brain than they would be inside the image. So I'm not sure, you know. Um, so some languages actually are completely different. So if you, if you look at uh, Turkish, it has reverse uh, uh, order compared to, to, uh, to English, let's say. Uh, so exactly reversed. Uh, so um, this is a nightmare for interpreters, for example. Within, within the sentence, not, within, reversed, within, not reversed within the page. <laughs> yeah, of course, within the sentence. But sentence is probably but already the, a, yeah, a but I'm, what I'm saying, like our idea, uh, if let's say you have an object inside the image, it has both uh, low level features as well as semantic features. Those things would be in separate regions in the brain, but they're in the same region in the image. In that sense, I meant whether they're uh, organized, uh, you know, spatially or in, in the image, spatially in the brain versus temporally in different languages. Tempor the temporal order is maintained maybe not locally, but definitely at, at above a certain scale, it's maintained across languages. Whereas, you know, here, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, so I'm just wondering. That's why I was asking about the alignment of the embedding spaces and so on. But in fMRI signals, do you see, so the, the simplest model for language, or at least that preceded the, the deep learning is, is co-occurrence. Uh, so if, for example, uh, uh, two words uh, appear one after uh, another frequently, uh, do you see something similar in fMRI? So if you, you see two visual objects in an image and you see them separately, will you get uh, some kind of a mixed response of uh, each of the individual responses or something completely okay. different? I don't know. And, and, and I don't think these things are known well enough in the brain. I mean, people are trying to, and, I, and I'm not a neuroscientist, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. But... Uh, not everything we see in the image do we know where they are expressed inside the brain. Okay, it's not like I could tell you here is the mapping from this to that. Whereas in languages, you can't tell me. Uh, so this is more like the Rosetta Stone, but you know, with another language that doesn't appear there and you want to translate it now and you have no idea, you don't have any knowledge. Well, neuroscience have more knowledge about the language that you, but it's definitely not the same spatial organization as it is in the image and uh, a lot is unknown. I guess another thing I found interesting in the BAT uh, re research, I don't, I don't think he's online anymore, but uh, this uh, idea of compressibility as a measure, uh, there was some point in the talk, a, is whether the model is learning well, right? And, a, or a, versus memorizing. So I know that this is, this is a big question in machine learning in general. Um, but it's also been used as a definition, sort of in a cryptographic setting, sort of, of um, a, you know, it, there's equivalences shown between definitions based on compressibility and definitions based on prediction. A, it's it'd be interesting to try to show that these are equivalent to each other and, and whether you can prove that, not just in empirical sense, but in some sort of a more analytical, theoretical sense. So it's also interesting. I, I also liked very much what what, what Jonathan was showing uh, towards the end and um, about uh, 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 trying to to understand the language of uh, well aliens in this in, in this case the, basically a language that is invented that is learned by by agents. Uh, um, I think NLP mostly focused on uh, existing language as well for very uh, practical consideration. I remember uh, once doing a test in um, uh, some unnamed organization in Israel where. The task was to to uh, to, to to translate from uh, an invented language with a vocabulary and a short explanation of the rules, mm -hmm. and then you're you're given a couple of pages and, and you need to translate. It. So that, that was an interesting exercise, and uh, I, I wonder if 
even if you remove the rules, if you just are given, uh, uh, let's say if you applied modern uh, technology to Rosetta Stone, just one piece of it uh, in one language, uh, would it work? Would it produce something that is uh, understandable? Mm -hmm. How about cryptography? If you have a, uh, a, a, a you had, let's say, the Enigma uh, code, and you knew it came from uh, a German uh, language, but you don't know what the so this would be like translating from one language to the other, not having the one to one correspondences, but do knowing which language this corresponds to. That's an, an interesting question to apply. That's an interesting question to apply sort of modern methods, modern yeah. say neural, neural network methods. For breaking to, cryptographic uh, <laughs> well, for, for breaking things that we know that are breakable. I, I would find it extremely un, unlikely that it would break modern things because then you would have factoring algorithms that are based on some total, you know. That's true. <laughs> you know, it would be, I, I don't believe it. But to break things like the Enigma where, um, it's an interesting question. I don't th know that people have actually looked at it. Uh, to, to, I guess, everyone here. This idea of compression and how compressible a thing is, is a measure of complexity and uh, distinguishing between different species. So, you know, we have these elephants or even between whales, we have the sperm whales. And I guess you have some sort of hierarchy that you suspect that some are more sophisticated than others. Um, and then you have different recordings and different dialects. Is there some notion of complexity that one suspects that could be related to, could be measured, something that seems totally unrelated to like compression? So, so I, I was um, asking if there, if there are some notions on um, what, what kind of uh, language uh, other species have. So in, in human language, we have some ideas about what are the formal properties or what kind of languages, in, say in the language hierarchy, in the Tom, Chomsky language hierarchy, we know that human languages are mostly context-free. Some, 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 in some cases, there are some context-sensitive phenomena, and some phenomena are actually regular or even sub-regular in realms of morphology. Um, do we have any such idea about human communication, any way to characterize it along these formal lines? I don't know. I think uh, uh, probably a human, uh, uh, non-human communication systems, at least from what I've read, are uh, uh, even not considered a language in the pure sense. You know, they, they lack some of the, the features that, that 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 human languages have. So it's uh, it, it, it's probably even difficult where to start. What are what are the basic units? Uh, uh... I think it's been a real challenge to. Uh other than the very simplest sort of tests that uh, a smear uh, ecologist can apply uh, to have a, a meaningful conversation about that. So, I mean, when the meeting that I first met Michael and, and David, uh, you know, not so long ago, uh, there was a linguist, Kevin Ryan, who may or may not actually be listening in still. Uh, and I think the first thing I said to David after that is that I've never had someone who calls himself a linguist even Sort of interact with us on the level of having those kinds of conversations. Um, so, um, and that gets into David's point about why this is exciting from a, a, a sort of interdisciplinary perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, agreeing on, on, on a universal definition of complexity across, you know, even primatologists and, and whale biologists has been a contentious, uh, debated thing for a long time, um, let alone the shifting bar of what might constitute a sort of stepwise uh, progression towards what a language is and what a communication system is, rather than just having these two buckets, uh, one that is you know, uniquely human and one that isn't. Um, so it's, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why this is exciting is to get at those kinds of things. But I think there is compression-based work to distinguish between different writers, say, that their work sort of uh, in, in between different languages. So certainly couldn't, so it's agnostic to, the, to biology or species or anything. It just talks about um, predictability, you know, compression and, and prediction and, and it can distinguish this way, which species we're talking about. 
it doesn't indicate necessarily complexity, but it would be, even for distinguishing purposes would be interesting. So it's a tool that has nothing, doesn't know anything about the domain, right? So Kevin is oh. here. Uh, uh, oh. <laughs> now uh, we, we have Kevin through as well, the, the linguist of, of Project SETI. Well, I'm not sure that, that he's, he's available, but maybe he, he, he can comment as uh, probably the best expert on, uh, uh, on anything related to language. Yeah. I think he may not be able to because he's a he's a participant rather than a panelist. So he, I think he can only use the chat or ask questions. Oh, something that um that Kevin said in our workshop was was really the importance of context, uh, of that being important. And I was thinking of uh, you know Yossi in his talk t today um, talked about the how he hand annotated that from the six bets, um, and then he said he actually solved that. But I didn't I, he didn't he didn't show how he solved it. I was really curious to think about that on how we. Um, you know, we're thinking about this, uh, these projects, it's like, where do you focus on? Um, and I think the, the work on, um, you know, on babies was also interesting because we, we sort of have an idea on humans on where, if we're trying to understand human language, at least we know ourselves hopefully better than, 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 um, than an elephant or a plant or a whale. Um, but, but to really understand where, which parts to look, I mean, I feel like uh, that's one of the, you know, with the limited budget and limited time, you know, which um, which aspects of the context are most important to find? Um, are we, you know, we're for the whales, for instance, we're focusing really on audio. Are we missing out by not including video? Uh, video? Is there parts of the um, the context that we should be focusing on more? Um, these are these are, I think, why hearing from so many different areas that uh, helps us kind of figure out where to where to search. As uh, as we we put our resources into figuring out context, I think Kevin is on now. But you could to unmute yourself if you want to speak. Oh hey, I I have to go in a couple minutes. But yeah, I'm really interested in these questions, and I'm not so interested in whether X is language or not, because that's a fairly arbitrary distinction and very human centric. Like human language has these properties and this complexity. And we can ask how similar other species are to humans. Um, but mo I'm more interested in the, the question of just the one that you raised, Shafi, how complex are these systems and where, where does that complexity reside? There's all these different modules of human language that were discussed today, things like phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and so forth. And we'll be investigating all of them and seeing where they fall in the Chomsky hierarchy and just more generally, yeah, what, how, how complex they are, how, how much information they can convey. Thanks, Kevin. Um, just the, this discussion has uh, reminded me of, of something. I, I, I think I talked uh, yesterday about um, coo rumbles, those rumbles that uh, mothers give to their, their infants when they're comforting their calves. And um, an elephant uh, once, I, I learned from an elephant <laughs> that she was about to give birth or that her mother was about to give birth from listening to her reach to her mother's vulva and give this same call. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then noticed that there was this mucus um, coming from the mother and she gave birth later, later that day. So, I mean, there are these com complex things that are happening that elephants are communicating to one another. Um, and that I just feel like we're just scratching the surface there, you know, we see them doing all these very complex things and then there's all this sound. Um, so somewhere in the future, we're gonna, we're gonna figure it out. 
<laughs> we have a long way to go. So with that, with that promise, <laughs> I think maybe we should, uh, you know, uh, say goodbye and we'll plan for another event. And um, again, thanks everyone. It was really great. One of my best two days this summer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.